Good morning and welcome to Stonebridge Church. My name is Tiffany Griggs and I'm the Director of Global Outreach. And I hope that you experience God's grace through this community and the generosity shown to us by Jesus Christ. You should have received an info card upon your arrival. Please take a, a moment to look at it and fill out the attendance to let us know you are here. You're also able to let us know any prayer requests you may have. We are thrilled to go before the throne of God before you. I am here with Kayla Rayapati, excuse me. Um, he, he is the founder of our school in India. Um, he is a dear friend to many, and he's going to be, be bringing our greeting and our um, call to worship today. And I also want to celebrate the fact that all of our children have been sponsored. And, praise the Lord and welcome, Caleb. Thank you. Namaste, as we say in India. I would like to uh, look at Psalm 119, which is the shortest and the smallest psalm, which says, um, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you people. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. All the nations. Rich nations, poor nations, communist nations, Arab nations, Hindu nations, all the nations of the Lord are called to worship the Lord. And all the people, red people, yellow people, black people, white people, any color people, regardless, they're all called to worship the Lord. However, in the country where I come from, they worship creation and the creatures than the creator God. One instant I can vividly remember is a well-dressed, educated man bowing before an idol, the rat, rat, R-A-T, rat, and surrounding the rat idol is this, some scores of rats, and he was reverently worshiping God. But how sad it is. But this morning, I believe God has given us a relationship with our creator God. He is sovereign God, supreme, the Lord of the nations, but he is also personal God to us, every single one of us who believe in him. Why? There are thousands of reasons. Here, there are two reasons. For his love, towards us and his faithfulness endures forever. There could be thousands of other reasons, but we have one reason is over and above that he is real to us and he is in the midst of us and we can worship him in truth and in spirit. Let us do that and give him all the glory and praise that he deserves. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for being our God, the living God, the creator of all. We thank you for this time that we can come together to worship, to praise, and to honor you. I pray, Father, that you would meet us here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Church, if you're able to, would you please stand with us? Let's worship our Lord through song.
Good morning. My name's Frank Lopane, one of the elders here and chair of our finance committee. Today, uh, Tim Mascara, who's one of our pastors, uh, will be talking about giving and give a brief financial update. We just sang about God's amazing grace, and giving is one of the ways we can respond to that amazing gift of grace. Paul, um, when writing uh, to the Corinthians, encourages them to model the churches of Macedonia who gave as much as they were able and even beyond their means. Um, he then encourages them to excel in this grace of giving. Yeah, Frank, and it's in excelling of that giving and out of that giving that we get to connect with and partner with the church community, the local community around us, and to the world to support ministry partners like Caleb and the work that they do in India from the school to church planting. We get to uh, partner and encourage the work done in Poland and Honduras and the Middle East and many other places where we have supported partners. It also supports the many ministry partners scattered across this city who, who walk alongside people, who help those in need, and, and point them to the work of Christ. It lets us uh, host and, and do big events like Trunk or Treat, where we had over 1,500 people on this campus having the opportunity to interact with and experience the love of Christ around them. Allows us to partner with uh, in a community barbecue with Faith CME and Grace and, and to connect us with our brothers and sisters who are racially diverse uh, compared to some of us in this university area. And your giving supports the daily rhythms of this church, and it's so much more than just staff in this building. Uh, we do, obviously, weekly programming. We get to come alongside marriages through the, the, the ministry of Holdfast grief share and divorce care and Stephen's ministry, many ministries that help walk alongside the people that are hurting in these moments, that are wrestling through these things. From there, we get to also uh, do midweek programming for kids and for students. And in fact, uh, once a month, we host here a Telugu service for our Indian friends. And I had the opportunity, the privilege, uh, the last couple of months to spend a lot of time at church during the day and night, and uh, I was amazed at the work of the Spirit through these ministries and an outreach of the community. This facility is used from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. to spread the gospel and to disciple, and you would be just so proud of that. Um, I want to now turn to a, just a brief financial update. Um, the figures on the screen are on your information card that you should have received. Um, I want to first say that the church is in a strong financial position with significant cash reserves and no debt. However, you can see that we have a giving deficit through a first quarter of our fiscal year. Uh, our expenses are also less than budgeted as we have some control over the timing of those expenses. Um, we will provide more information in the Wednesday church email. In addition, there'll be information on how to do year-end giving. Um, and if you have any questions about financial information, please reach out to Tim or I at any time. As Frank said in the beginning, right, our giving is an act of worship. It's an opportunity for us to tangibly practice uh, sacrifice and, and gratitude to tangibly practice generosity in the same way that we tangibly get to partake in communion. The act of giving allows us to tangibly do something. And we encourage you, if, if, uh, if you have uh, not been, that you would, if this is new to you, start today. Come alongside with us. Come alongside with the work of Christ through the local church, through Stonebridge, and experience the joy of giving. We talk about there are many ways in which you can give from personal checks to Venmo, uh, but now we want to take a moment and pray that the Lord would continue to use your generosity and the church's generosity to further his amazing name. Frank. Heavenly Father, we pause now to say thank you. 
Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for the power, freedom, and finality of the work of Jesus on the cross. May we more and more rely and rest upon your grace, your mercy, and your provision in our lives. I know in my life, I can take your generosity for granted, living like I am in control, holding tight to the things of this world. May we grow in loosening our grip on what you have provided us. May we model the Macedonian church who gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. May we as individuals and a church excel in this grace of giving. Father, as we close this time now, may you remind us that we are yours. As we just sang, our chains are gone. We're free. Remind us of our certainty and security in you that that we're yours and nothing can separate us from your love. May we trust you in your word and your promise to provide for us. The God who is faithful will do it. You even call us to test you specifically in these matters. And for many, if not all of us, we, I, can feel anxious about stepping out in this way. Whether it's my or our own heart of comfort or worry about providing, instill in us through the power of your spirit a deeper faith, a deeper hope, and a deeper love for you, your people, and your world. May you use our generosity to further your gospel presence in the world. In the saving and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 28. Hear now the word of our true and living God. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you, Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, all. My name is Soon Pot, one of the pastors, and whether you're joining us here live or uh, online, so glad we can rest and to worship. At Stonebridge, we have two services. We have a nine o'clock uh, uh, that meets just prior to here, and I'm sad you got to miss, uh, miss it. We got to baptize um, uh, two little children, uh, Ellie and Logan Doyle, and I remarked, and it was beautiful afterwards, Ellie, I think she's two or three, uh, was just dancing during one of the worship songs. Uh, and it was just this beautiful picture, I think, as I watched, and uh, of what I hope that we all experience at one point in our service and our time together here. You know, sometimes we come to church because our friends are coming, or we come to church because it's the right thing to do, or we come to church because uh, we actually want to learn more about God's Word. And those are all good things, a gift of Christian fellowship. But I think there's this moment where God calls us to be overwhelmed by his presence. And when you don't think about even what's on the screen, the words on the screen or the music that's being played or the burdens you carry on your shoulders, but we can just openly dance before a father who loves us. And it's this beautiful picture in this really uh, small way, I hope, that we can experience together uh, this morning. And whether this is your first time in a church and you come just exploring who God is or exploring uh, what this gospel thing or Jesus thing is all about, or whether this is home for you or you have known what it means to be loved by Jesus, I hope and pray by the Spirit of God uh, that he meets you and God's presence and love and affection overwhelms you 
and then your heart can respond to him in kind. Let's go to him in prayer as we unpack these beautiful words given to us uh, through the Apostle Paul, but all breathed by God. Heavenly Father, we are thankful. The skies declare your glory. The heavens declare your glory. And God, who spoke all things uh, by the very power of your word, Lord, uh, by the same words you call us beloved, not because of anything we have done, but those who have repented of their sins and have placed their faith in you, you call us precious, uh, beloved sons and daughters. And Lord, by your spirit, you awaken in us uh, to walk towards you, to move towards you, to be wooed by you, and let our hearts become fully alive to recognize in the work of uh, Jesus on the cross, Lord, uh, that he lived the life that we could not live and on the cross died to death we so deserve, and that in him we can have new life. The old has uh, passed away, and behold, the new has come. And Father, we know these truths, yet we, are, we have a hard time living it out. Lord, when we walk, we stumble over our doubts, our fears, and our failures. Uh, we come to this place sometimes just um, not realizing all the hardships that we carry in it. Yet, Lord, that you tenderly walk with us. You tenderly sit with us. Uh, you gently uh, give us grace to carry on, to step forward. And Lord, I pray for our time today as we unpack these words. Let it be um, as much as it is as impacting and diving deeper into your word. Let it be uh, the song of our hearts to awaken in us the affection of what it means to be loved by you, to have full trust in you and hope only in you. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you've been with us, you know that we've been working our way through 1 Thessalonians, this letter by the Apostle Paul to the church in Thessalonica. And today we're closing it out and going to the very end. Yet, we're having one more week next week, uh, verses 16 through 18. Uh, we're going to pull out from today, and we're going to talk about it next week in light of Thanksgiving week, really talking about gratitude, where we're going to finish our series in Thessalonians uh, today in one sense. And if you journeyed with us, you know that the Apostle Paul, this first century leader in the Christian church, this first century man who was called by God to be an apostle of God, is speaking words to this young and early church, to words encourage and challenge and to sustain them in a time of persecution and affliction. And sometimes when we think about a church that in, under persecution, we may not relate as well for many of us in this room that uh, haven't has faced those kind of opposition from the world around us. Yesterday, well, beginning our service today, you heard uh, from our brother Caleb talking about the beautiful ministry in India. Last night, I got to spend some time with him, and he was sharing at the very beginning that he was um, going from town to town and doing open-air evangelism. Uh, he said he loved it, and uh, you know, going to those street corners and just sharing the gospel and evangelizing. And uh, He would go back after some of these uh, men and women had come to faith and to his home church, and they would say, well, no, 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 uh, we can't do any work there. It's too dangerous. Uh, they're hostile to Christians in those areas, uh, and I think speaks about Caleb, where he boldly kept going and sharing the gospel. And I imagine the very similar circumstance if Caleb wrote a letter to one of the 125 churches that are there because of his work, uh, the 25 pastors that are working in India um, and Telangana State that we get to be a part of. And I imagine those letters going to those churches who are still facing hostility, not because of anything, but that they claim to know Jesus and who he is. I think there's, you can relate with that in this letter that Paul is writing to the Thessalonian church. And he's reminding them, don't just survive, don't just weather, but be a people, a purpose. That God has called you for a purpose in this hostile world. Don't be a people of your circumstance, but be a people, a purpose. And what we've been learning as we've been navigating through Thessalonians is the idea that God has called them for that specific purpose. Know who you are. Know who you belong to. Know why I've called you. And Paul keeps reminding them of the gospel. And he says, hold on to these things, but also live in a way that echoes that life and midst of your world. And it's important here as we get to this final passage because there's a lot of do's. Do this, be this way and these instructions of what it means to live out the Christian faith. But it's important to pause here just to remember once again how important and unique the Christian faith is. 
that the world around us wants to dilute the message and preach another gospel, which is no gospel at all. See, the ethic of the world is if you live a certain way, if you do the right things, if you can put all the pieces together, then life will work out the way you want it to. If you do all the right things, you will finally be accepted. And the good news that we preach to ourselves, the good news that we echo every Sunday morning, we sing about, we talk about, and hopefully in, even in my life, I have to preach to myself this beautiful gospel, is that my ethic does not earn my righteousness before God, that my ethic doesn't earn a rightness in my view, in God's view of me. See, every other ethic says, do the right thing and you'll be accepted. But the gospel says, you are chosen, you are accepted. If you've repented of your sins and confessed of where you've fallen short and put your faith in Jesus Christ, God says, you are accepted. There's nothing you can do to lose that. See, not in fear of losing our acceptance, but living into the full reality of that truth. This uh, today, after the service, our family is driving down to Gainesville for this next week. We have a gauntlet of activities. Uh, we have Thanksgiving. I don't know if you guys are celebrating that, but that we're doing that. Uh, Aaron's in a wedding for one of our close friends who's getting married for the first time. Uh, uh, she, uh, so we're excited about that. Aaron's sister's um, uh, 40th birthday party, so that's, that, that's happening too. Uh, but I'm really excited about tomorrow. Aaron's brother, my brother-in-law, and uh, her sister-in-law, they're adopting two children into their family. They've been fostering them, and now they're adopting them. So we're all going to the courthouse. Uh, it's going to be about 20 plus of us, aunts and uncles, and uh, uh, brothers and sisters, and a bunch of grandkids, and we're going to be there. And I don't know how this works, but don't correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in that moment in the courtroom when the judge uh, puts pen to paper, and they officially become part of the family, there's nothing they can do to undo that. It's going to be this beautiful picture in that moment. We get to celebrate that they are part officially, when pen goes to paper, that they're part of the family. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's such a simple truth, but we miss it, that you are accepted. And when Jesus puts a pen to paper, your name on the cross, and there's nothing you can do to undo that. And Jesus signed your name with blood, and he put it on the cross, and there's nothing you can do to undo that. You are accepted. And it's out of that, he says, this is then how you should live. You can't re-earn that. It's been done, but now live into that name that Jesus has given you. Live into the gospel of how then you shall live. It's important we get that. Because so many people in the Christian church has harmed so many generations that's put that ahead of the gospel. Do these things and you will be a good Christian. No, friends, we are accepted in Jesus, and then this is how we should live. Then Paul gives many instructions, but I want to um, talk about nine instructions uh, that we find in the text read today. I know, a nine-point sermon. If this is your first time here, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to go through them uh, faster than you think. First three, three responsibilities of the leaders in this community of God in the church. Three, next is three responsibility of the people of God in this community. And finally, three counter-responses, counter-reactions uh, to the ethics of the world uh, that Paul gives out. First, three responsibilities of a leader. Our series in First Thessalonians has been called uh, People of Purpose, a people of purpose. But uh, what that essentially means is the church. Uh, the church is a people of purpose. That we don't mean some other group of people, but we're talking about the church. And the church isn't just a gathering of Christians as much as we think it is. It's not just a gathering of Christians. It is the means in which God's kingdom becomes established and expanded. The church is the means in which God's kingdom is established and expanded. And in it is a movement. See, Paul understood this, that early first century apostle of God, Paul, this follower of Jesus, understood what that meant and his strategy in establish, establishing and expanding God's kingdom was through church planting. He would go from city to city. And how he would do that, he would get to a city and he would raise up leaders. He would raise up leaders to say, I will train and disciple you and equip you so that you can be raised up to help establish this church not just to take care of yourself, but to expand it. Then you would go from city 
the city as we've learned as we explored 1 Thessalonians. In verse 12, he goes and talks about it. He says this, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, now he's talking about how we should respond to the leaders, but also have expectations of those people that was raised up in the church to lead, lead the church. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and admonish you. In a church, there are those who hold the official office of a leader, but we know there are also many leaders in the church that help the movement of God. We have the office of a leader in our church. Uh, uh, the formal office is elders and deacons. And I'll speak about that just for a few minutes, that it's important, the passage does say, Paul says, you know, hold them in the highest regard because of the hard work, in love because of their work not just to puff them up, but to give them respect because God is calling them to help lead us in our church. Actually, I wanna, it's a good way to share about a, a congregational meeting coming up on December 10th uh, where we're gonna uh, elect our new officers. And it's a little segue, right? Uh, I wanna share with you, please, please, please go to the website, stonebridge.org slash officer candidates. It's a way you can learn more about uh, these men that have gone through the nomination process, that have gone through the training and equipping, and now as a church, we get to elect them and pray for them and to help lead them in the church. And that's some living out what Paul's calling us, to hold them in high regard, to respect them and to pray for them. But let's go back to what we're talking about, because leaders aren't just the, uh, the, the officers in the church, right? We have men and women who are ministry leaders, uh, we have men and women who lead our student and children ministries, who lead life groups, who lead serving ministries, and lead in so many different ways in our church. All ways that they're helping the movement of God, helping establish and expand God's kingdom. For those leading, those responsibilities they carry in the relationship is this, that they work hard among you, that they care for you, and they admonish you. Three responsibilities. First, that they work hard among you. Leaders aren't, aren't the kind of people that rush to the front of the line when something's being served. Uh, they, 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 they're the ones that rush to the front of the line when something needs to be done. Matthew Henry says that uh, la- leaders are laborers in God's kingdom, not loiterers. And this term, this Greek term about laboring, it, it, it actually comes from a very physical labor that to the point of exhaustion that they're working hard among you. Uh, and I don't think Paul is trying to say, don't be unbalanced. But what he is trying to convey is that for all the leaders in the room, it says that when there's work that needs to be done, leaders step up. When a situation arises where leaders are needed, Christian leaders respond, that they work hard. The gospel gives us rest. When we worship together, there's a restfulness we have in Jesus and him alone. We're also called to work hard. And if you want to be a leader in a church, that means you're stepping up and you're entering in and you're the first to the line saying, how can I help us in this situation? I think of a term that's gotten popular recently is called quiet quitting. Have you guys heard of this? I'm, I feel kind of old. You guys may know. <laughs> yeah, of course we know what this is. It's this idea you don't quit from a job, but you kind of just keep going, but you just keep doing the bare minimum. So you don't really work hard to move up on the ladder. Uh, You don't do enough to get noticed, but you're just kind of like skating by, just collecting a paycheck, and you're just kind of quiet quitting. Church, that is not what a Christian leader does, and that is not what uh, it means to be a leader, that we're all called in some sense to be leaders in that sense, to step up and work hard. Second is that they care for you. And I hope this doesn't feel like we're bragging, but more just encouraging is this idea uh, that For the past two years, the staff and then the elders, that uh, we've taken time to pray for our church. You think, well, I think every church does that. Well, we've actually printed not just, you know, generally, but each name and each family and individuals and children, and we've taken time in small groups uh, each time we meet to pray systematically so we can be praying for you all, that we care for you. Uh, I think of a story just this past week. One of our deacons got a phone call at 2.30 in the morning uh, because of a housing situation, and they responded, uh, and that they weighed on them and cared, and they walked with them until uh, they could secure something in the short term to get them back on their feet. Uh, but there's people in this church, the leaders of this church care for each and every one of you. 
I think of our children's ministry or student ministry and how often they pray for the students and come alongside them. And the church is built upon a foundation of care because Jesus cares. And Christian leaders are all in Jesus, and we care because Jesus is in us. Uh, One commentator talks about how church leaders are commissioned by Christ uh, to carry the oversight of the flock according to his will and not their own. This idea of we're carrying the very care of Jesus into the life of the church. The third one, he says, is admonish you. Leaders are called to admonish you, uh, which means it carries the idea of rebuke and correct. Show of hands, who likes being corrected or rebuked? I don't really enjoy that at all. Uh, uh, Yeah, I don't like being told I'm wrong. Uh, I don't think any of us like those words, right? But what the word carries is this idea if, you know, I have children and we're trying to get from point A to point B, and you're trying to corral them along, you just start seeing one of them just start wandering off. You're like, you're just trying to bring them back in. And that's what this means. This idea is like we're trying to move in a direction. The church is a movement of God, and we're going in this direction. There's a commitment from all of us saying we're going to do this together, not just to care for each other and not just to make sure we're doing the right things, but we're actually in a movement towards what God's calling us to. If we see one of us start moving away, we're bringing them back into the alignment, to the full life that God is calling us to. It's this beautiful idea of the church that's moving Leadership and admonishment appears all over Paul's letters. In Timothy, Paul talks about, uh, to Paul encourages Timothy, a young leader, and he says, correct, rebuke, and encourage those under your care with great patience and careful instruction. The goal is not just correct behavior, but alignment to the goodness of God. And he does it with patience and thoughtfulness. These are the responsibilities that church, that if you're a leader in this church, that you're called to, And if you are someone who comes to the church, you can expect out of the leaders at our church that they work hard, they care for you in the Lord, and they will come and talk to you to admonish you, to correct and rebuke to the life that God is calling you to. So what about the next three? Three responsibilities of the people of God. See, the church isn't just about pastors or what leaders do. The call for transformation, care, and accountability is in the hands of everyone who calls themselves a follower of of Jesus. Paul asks the brothers and sisters in relation to the leaders, but then he talks to the people and he says, he doesn't just remind them, he urges them. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened and help the weak. One of the main issues in the Thessalonian church was uh, this theological term called overrealized eschatology. And what that means is that they saw the future coming of Jesus, that Jesus was coming one day soon, and it so radically shaped uh, their life in the, in the present, and you think, well, that's a good thing, but it radicalized them to the point they just quit working. Like, what's the point of any of this? What's the point of working? Jesus is coming back. He may come back tomorrow. I don't need to do anything. Paul is trying to rebuke that mentality. They're like, well, he, they have this future vision. Why, why are you doing it? Because he's saying work is important in the day, the day. My freshman year at the University of Florida uh, is when I felt like God was calling me into ministry. God had worked on me for about two years, but it was that time, time uh, speaking with one of my mentors uh, and friends, and I just felt God's call saying, hey, God, or not, hey, God, God saying, hey, soon, uh, calling me into full-time gospel ministry. At the time, you know, I was going on to the, uh, we had this huge public lawn, and we were doing worship, and uh, evangelism and talking with uh, other students and really felt alive when I was doing that. So I stopped going to class. I said, well, what's the point of class? I'm going to do uh, gospel work anyway. Uh, fast forward, I met Erin, my wife now, and she said, I'm not going to marry a college dropout. You got you to gotta, you gotta finish this out, uh, which I did. Please don't ask me my GPA, but I did finish. Uh, that's important. A similar thing was happening in Thessalonica. And what Paul is pointing to is the central of church community. Yes, sharing and proclaiming Jesus Christ is of high value. Yes, what it means to carry one another's burdens and helping the weak and the disheartened and doing life of the church, but also that we have to work out in our day-to-day lives. Another way to say it is this, that the idea of the church community is one that we have freedom to challenge one another to live out that movement of God life, but it doesn't overwhelm us to the sense that we forget about the duties that we carry in our present age. So we come alongside others. We encourage them. We challenge them. 
And that's what the beauty of the church is. The church is unique, unlike anything else. The church calls us saying, come as you are broken, come as you are battered, come as you are bruised, but also that the grace of Jesus allows you to be transformed. As a brother in the Lord, if you come to me, I'm gonna walk with you when you can barely get out of bed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step into the life with you. I'm gonna encourage the weak and the disheartened. I'm gonna walk with you, but I'm gonna always point you back to Jesus who says, live your life for him the author and perfecter of your faith, to get you back in alignment to the life that God is calling you to. So what does that look like? How does this actually live out in the life of a Christian, especially in our day and age today, as well as in the first century? Well, we talk about this counter response to the world, counter response to the world, counter ethics to the world. And I believe what Paul is doing in this section is he's trying to shape a Christian response uh, to a, a pagan world in the first century, a common Roman ethics. And he's dismantling it, showing this is how a Christian should respond. Three ways. The first is this. It says, live in peace and with patience. Live in peace and with patience. At the end of verse 13, it says, live in peace with one another. After he gives instructions about the leaders. He says, live in peace with one another. At the end of 14, as he gives instructions to the church, he says, be patient with everyone. This ethos of peace and patience are central in Christian formation. And uh, these attributes are ascribed to God all throughout the Old Testament. And these are the attributes that Jesus proclaims in his earthly ministry. And here Paul echoes to the church in Thessalonica, but also elsewhere. It is the bridge in which more responsibilities and accountability is held within the people of God. And it's a counter world ethic that was common in Rome that glorified violence and action. And the Roman ethic was violence and action. Here's Paul saying, live with peace and patience. See, it was true in the Roman world, and I think it's true of us today, that our hearts are drawn toward violence and swift action. It's this increased anxiety we may feel when we watch the news or we interact with differing ideas or, or when we engage someone that we disagree with. We feel that anxiety that wants to move towards quick action. The idea of peace and patience should not make sense to a world that glorifies sensationalism and immediacy. And I wanna challenge us, as Paul was challenged them, are you a person of peace? Are you a person of patience? In a chaotic world, would your neighbors, would your coworkers, uh, would your classmates look at you saying, this man or woman is a person of peace and patience? I would challenge us with that. Sit in that. Those are the bridge and the ethics of a response in a pagan world. Second is live with retributive goodness. Retributive goodness. Verse 15. Paul says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Historical commentators talk about how uh, this sect of uh, Jewish faith called Christianity in the first century, how it became this powerful force and increased its influence uh, through the Roman world and eventually um, the Western world and the world as we know it. And they say, you can trace it back to those first 100 and 200 years. They, the most powerful force they had, the most influential thing that they carried, the most effective way they were able to expand God's kingdom in those early days when they had little influence, little power, little resources. And it was their commitment to radical generosity, radical hospitality. That they weren't just taking care of their own, but they were also taking care of others. The pagan emperors and uh, pagan writers would talk about the Christians saying, hey, they're not just uh, taking care of the people in their circle, they're taking our people as well. And that commitment radicalized, uh, radically transformed the makeup of our world and the expansion of Christianity. It's this counter ethic to what everyone else was doing. In Matthew 5, Jesus talks about it. He says, you have heard, you have heard, that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So this was the common saying, take care of your own and make sure those people aren't part of our group. And Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies. 
and pray for those who persecute you. See, Paul is just echoing Jesus' words. When someone wrongs you, don't repay them with wrong. But he goes further. He says, strive or zealously seek out. You are aggressively seeking out the goodness of those who are harming you, who are your enemies. And here's the more radical part. He says, not just for the people in here, not the enemies you see in this room, but the people out there, for everyone else. Everyone else. This good news of restoration is not just for in here, but it's for people out there as well. See, Paul is expanding the circle. See, the people that have wronged you, the the people that are against you, who are actively seeing your demise, the people that bully you, your enemies, retribution is at hand. The gospel is saying, yes, something is coming for them. The world says, well, they're gonna get what there's coming for them, and they think it's punishment and evil, and you're saying the gospel says, you're gonna be the means in which God's gonna communicate his goodness to them. The people you can't get along with, the people that are actively against you, God is saying something's coming to them and I'm gonna use you to be the means in which goodness overflows, that they can taste and see the goodness of God. You become the means in which God's goodness carries forth. William Barclay, the quote that was up earlier, says, when a church lives up to Paul's advice, it will indeed shine like a light in a dark place. It will have joy within itself and power to win others. This is that counter ethic. When the world sees something that's so radically different that you're not just taking care of your own people, but you're radically committed to not just people that you agree with or like you or you're friends with, but people are actively against you that you're still moving towards a gospel ethic of sharing goodness with them the world will take notice and that light enters into the darkest relationships that you may encounter. Think of your world, maybe if it's at your school, maybe in your neighborhood, in your work environment, or in any of those people that you can't stand because you disagree with them or people that don't like you. And you say, God, I am praying for them. How can I bless them? How can I bring God's goodness? And the question you should have to, but what about justice? They've wronged me and you have no idea. We're going to get to that. Live under spiritual justice is the third counter ethic. Verse 19 through 22 says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. It says, Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. In God's kingdom, this is important, justice is never separated from the spiritual. In God's kingdom, Justice is never separated from the spiritual. God, reign and kingdom is everywhere. God calls the early Christians to reject every kind of evil and hold on to what is good. There is a clear line that Paul is driving here and that Jesus drives and the scriptures drives, that there is a, a clear line between what is good and what is evil in our world. And we've allowed competing voices to confuse those lines sometimes. And worse yet, we've said what is good, we've called evil, and what is evil, we've called good. And when God brings justice to all the evil in our world and ushers in the goodness of God, it's not defined by what's around us, it's defined by the very word of God. This is what it's saying. It's God's word that defines what is evil and good. And Paul encourages the Thessalonians, live into this kind of justice that is only found not in what we think is right and wrong, but by the very word of God. Test all truth in alignment to the revealed word of God. Not what we feel is right, nor what would offend less people, but God's truth given us to in scripture. And when we do that, God's kingdom moves. And when we do that, God's kingdom moves and the world will push back. That's exactly what happened in the early church in Thessalonica in the first century. And that's when persecution started rising up. Says this is how we will have impact. This is what it means to be placed for a purpose. These counter ethics in a hostile world. Live in peace and with patience. Live with retributive goodness. Live under spiritual justice, the justice of God according to God's word. Sometimes it feels overwhelming, right? Uh, there is, it can be hard. Uh, uh, we've been closing our services uh, with the same benediction. If you've noticed through our series and people of purpose, 1 Thessalonians. 
And it's this passage. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. We covered a lot of instructions today by Paul, and we didn't get to them all. We kind of just skipped the whole one about greeting each other with a holy kiss. Uh, you know, it's an imperative. It is an instruction, so we're going to start doing that next week. Uh, we'll have mouthwash for everyone. It'll be fine. Um, no, we, there's a lot of instructions on how, and some of it can be daunting when we talk about replying it into our real lives. But it's the hope of these words that can carry us. I want to invite our band up into the stage. And I remind, I want to leave you with this. It's the simple truth. Your hope is only in Jesus. And not just in your salvation or what he did on the cross, but also in your sanctification, how we become more and more like Jesus. The enemy and the world will throw everything at you and everything it can do to take your eyes off of Jesus. It will pull at your identity, it will pull at your security, and it will pull at your worth. Hear these words. Any situation you feel like there's no way God can show up, hear these words. God himself, God, the creator of all the universe, all of creation, one who spoke and the stars became, one who came and did everything, says that God that God is for you and is sanctifying you. Everything you are that you're being transformed, restored, renewed is in Jesus. Jesus is your hope. And when you feel like you can't do it, you feel like the world's all against you, you feel like the, stack, the deck is stacked against you, and it feels like there's nothing in your life will ever change. You feel like I've given up on that relationship, I've given up on my marriage, I've given up on my relationship with my children and my grandchildren. This is the promise of the God of the universe. And he says, I will do it. The one who has called you is faithful. This is the promise we lean into and saying, I don't know what it looks like to be good to the people that have hurt me so deeply. I don't know what it looks like to live with peace and patience and rest in my heart when it feels like anxiety has taken over every square of my life. I don't even know what justice looks like. There's so much wrong. This hope in Jesus, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Cling to him and he will carry you through it all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your glory, your goodness, your grace and mercy. Lord, thank you that it is not up to us, not just even in our salvation, but what it means to grow in our faith and hope in you. And Lord, while we try our best, we know it is your overwhelming grace, overwhelming mercy, overwhelming strength through your Holy Spirit that carries us. And God, in you and you alone, we declare our hope, not in what I can do, but only in you. We pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
what joy it is to rest and to worship together as one body. If you're visiting for the first time, we would love to get to know you better. Please visit the welcome desk, which is right to your right when you exit, uh, just to get to know you. And, um, and, and as we're running this race together, that we can um, journey with each other in Jesus and him alone. Receive the benediction, a good word, a promise from scripture for all of us, not to hoard, but to extend to the world around us. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And may your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Go in peace, amen.